Continuing education credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. Check out cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information. The Cribsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and informational purposes only. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host. Well, welcome back to the Cribsiders. I'm Chris the Chew Man Chew, and I'm joined by our amazing AAP National Conference exhibition team, including Sydney Engel and Dr. Nick Lee. I'm pointing to them as if people can see me, but of course they can't. Our guest tonight is Dr. Carlo DiLorenzo to discuss gastroesophageal reflux. But first, let's remind you about the show. We are the Pediatric Medicine Podcast. We interview leading experts in the field to bring clinical pearls, practice changing knowledge, and answering lingering questions about core topics in pediatric medicine. We have a fantastic conversation with our guest, Dr. DiLorenzo. He is a professor of pediatrics at The Ohio State University Woo-hoo. and chief of the Division of Pediatric Gastroenterology at Nationwide Children's Hospital. He has published more than 300 peer-reviewed and invited manuscripts in the field of functional and motility disorders and has co-authored the only three books on pediatric GI motility. He has been the president of the North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition. He has also chaired the Rome 3 and Rome 4 Child Adolescent Committees. He was awarded the Master Award in Gastroenterology by the AGA and the Nasvigan Schwachman Award. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, we should get into it, shouldn't we? Let's do it. All right. All right. So hi, Dr. DeLorenzo. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, first, because we are an informal group, I'd like to ask, is it okay to call you by your first name, Carlo? I actually prefer. Thank you. Go ahead. Amazing. Well, we're so happy you're here. We like to start by getting to know our guests a little bit better. So my first question for you is, can you give us a one-liner to describe yourself? All right. Let's try. I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist, uh, born and raised in the south of Italy, but very proud to be also an American now. And uh, I'm passionate about uh, research and, uh, and uh, clinical care. I'm uh, the father of four wonderful children. I'm also incredibly addicted to any type of sport, and I spend way too much time on social media. Um, <laughs> that's as short as I can make it. <laughs> Love it. Perfect. We um, have a lot of trainees who listen to this podcast, medical students, Mm -hmm. residents, even fellows, and you're such an accomplished individual. Um, Do you have any advice for them on how to progress through their career that you were once given or that you give your trainees to be successful? Yeah, one thing that I have been mentioning to my younger colleagues and trainees is that it's not as much where you start from, and it's not even that much where you end up is really about the people that you travel with. Find uh, an environment that is fun to go to work at. You know, try to find colleagues that you enjoy seeing in the morning. It's going to make it a lot easier for you to go to work. And then and, and it's a long, it's going to be 30, 40 years of work. You want to do it in a pleasant, pleasant environment. So that's actually something that uh, I've been lucky to be with, you know, finding people that I truly love to work with, and I hope that everybody can do that. So that's one piece of advice. I like it. It's um, good, good piece of advice. Yeah. So you just said that you you spend too much time on social media. Mm-hmm. What, what are you on? Are you on TikTok or Twitter? I'm on, uh, <laughs> I'm on Twitter a lot. I don't think I go two hours without checking uh, uh, tweets. Uh, I do unfortunately have a little addiction to tiktok as well uh, it's my pre-nighttime uh, activity you know i usually try to keep it to a few minutes but i rarely do and uh, so i enjoy tiktok and you know i do facebook and uh, some instagram and so on but uh, for me myself probably twitter is my favorite uh, media so out of all the social media platforms if there's one person that our listeners or one group of people that they should follow who, who should they follow Ah, that's a good question because I try to keep uh, my, I only follow 99 people because otherwise it gets too much. So I need to kick people out when I put somebody in. Wow. Um, Impressive. So I don't know. I think uh, there are a lot of good colleagues to follow. Miranda Van Tilburg is a psychologist in uh, North Carolina and now in West Virginia that is really good follow. Mark Reed, who wrote a book about medical axioms, is a tremendous follow. Those are two that comes to my mind. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Any other questions or should we jump into it? 
All right. We can start with our first case. But before we do that, let's hear from one of the sponsors that helps support the show. This episode is brought to you by Pattern. Pattern is the number one physician recommended provider for disability insurance. At Pattern, they use data-driven approaches to streamline the process for securing a policy, eliminating wasted time, and preventing confusion for doctors like you. You have other things to do. Head to patternlife.com slash curbsiders and request your free quote directly from the website. Then review your options with a trusted advisor and ask any questions that are on your mind. Finally, you can secure your policy and take on your future with confidence. Work with Pattern and leave as an educated, fully insured physician with peace of mind regarding your financial future. So our first case from Cash Like Children's, Flo is an eight-week-old infant at her two-month well child check who has had increasing amounts of spit up over the past few weeks. The infant's breastfeeding every three hours with 15 minutes on each breast. They say that they've been ensuring to not overfeed her. The spit-ups occur about an hour after feeding and are maybe like partially digested breast milk. The parents have a hard time knowing exactly what that looks like. They say that over the past, you know, a couple of weeks, last week or two, there's been some new like fussiness and arching of her back when she spits up that's made them concerned because it looks like she's uncomfortable. Her growth curve remains about normal. She's still at the 60th percentile where she's always been for height and weight without any changes in her velocity. So our first kind of even, you know, there's a lot in that history, but... I like to talk about, you know, there's reflux and then there's there's GER and there's GERD and, you know, all these other terms. So I guess maybe before we dive into everything, can you just like orient us to the mm-hmm. landscape of terminology that we're going to be using okay. the whole episode? <laughs> sure. So gastroesophageal reflux, GER, without a D, is a physiologic event, right? We all do it. In fact, babies don't do it a lot more than grown-ups, but you see every episode of reflux because the esophagus of a newborn is two, three inches long and ours is like, you know, a 20, 30 centimeter long. So, so that's a physiologic event that we all should have. Actually, it's a good thing we have that because sometimes the content of the stomach needs to escape upwards a little bit to make you feel better. So that's okay. GERD is when reflux begins to create problems, when it becomes more than just a physiologic event and it causes either symptoms or consequences of too much reflux. So we used to call those uh, events bothersome events, mm-hmm. which uh, in a child that can communicate symptoms or in a grown-ups is very easy to define, but it's very difficult to define in a one-month-old or two-month-old, and then it becomes also complex to figure out bothersome for whom, for the child mm-hmm. or, or for the parents. Like in this case, it seems like the, the parents are very concerned. They come to see you. And sometimes the best you can do is to educate what's normal and what's not normal. So what sort of questions do you like when you're talking to a parent? Understandably, you know, probably by the time that they get to a pediatric GI office, maybe Mm -hmm. it's a little, you're seeing a different subset, but in like a primary care office, what would you recommend that a pediatrician ask to help discern whether or not it's really bothersome or you should be worried about GERD with the D? So I think a, a good question in general is, why are you guys here? What what brings you here? What are you most worried about, right? If they are worried about the fact that the child is vomiting everything, then you can point out that they are keeping down enough because they are the you know in the middle of the chart for the growth. I also feel like they need to know maybe this was the first child or the maybe the first child that they had was a particularly easy one. But sometimes it's good to know what's normal. You can tell them that you know four regurgitations, four vomiting per day is normal in a, a you know it's, it's seen in 20 30 percent of babies at three four months of age the excessive crying what is normal crying you know two hours plus minus another hour and a half is the normal amount of crying in babies two, that are two three months of age so if they know that what they are seeing in their baby is also what most parents see in their other babies Sometimes that's enough to provide some reassurance. So getting a feel for what concerns them the most and then try to educate or what's within the spectrum of normality. And there are some babies that are easy, you know, you can cruise by and others that are a little bit more challenging, but doesn't mean that one is a disease and the one doesn't. And I guess what sort of things do you hear from parents sometimes mm-hmm. that make you a little bit more concerned yeah. and feel like you need to start trialing certain things, I guess, in the history? Right. So if we go back to the case that you just mentioned, I think the thing that bothers me a little bit more is the fact that uh, the baby 
vomits or regurgitates, uh, I don't know what term you use, but an hour after feeding. The vast majority of babies that we used to call happy spitters or that have cur without a D usually do it fairly immediately after the feeding, you know, as soon as they're done eating. So doing it an hour or two hours after feeding to me is a little bit... uh, a pink flag, maybe not quite a red flag yet, <laughs> but uh, maybe a little bit uh, something that gets my attention. And then I always try to ask, did you ever see green in the vomiting? Because bilious vomiting is a big red flag, actually. That, that one makes me worried about malrotation and uh, things that can cause problems down the line. Obviously, you want to know if there is any blood in the vomiting, you know, how projectile it is. Now, so in real life, Many episodes, many people will present with a mix of some effortless and some more forceful. And but if they are consistently projectile, that gets my attention as well. And then all the classic red flags: a child that is not growing well, uh, or that is truly inconsolable in the crying, or you know gets some developmental delay or some movement abnormalities. Then you begin to worry about maybe some CNS or genetic issues. So. I wanted to ask about, you mentioned like the normal Mm. amount of crying is usually two, two and a half hours is not at all concerning. In a patient where you do see the parent complaining of more than that Mm -hmm. number of hours of crying, often the assumption, especially among certain cultural groups, is that it is caused by reflux without any clear demonstration of that. Mm. Is there any evidence to bear that out? Is crying more, does that increase your suspicion for GERD with a D? In some way, maybe it makes me less suspicious for reflux because uh, people have done a lot of studies, uh, studies in which they've correlated correlated video camera monitoring with pH uh, uh, monitoring, and they found absolutely no correlation whatsoever in amount of crying, amount of arching, which is another common misconception, and that's due to reflux, and true reflux, which makes sense because most of the reflux in babies is non-acidic, and... Milk doesn't hurt when it goes down, and it doesn't hurt when it comes up. That should not be painful. And babies almost never have true erosive esophagitis, which would really cause the pain. So reflux should not be painful in a, in a baby. So the, the, the crying, to me, doesn't really correlate with reflux. And in fact, it makes me maybe more concerned about dietary protein intolerance or allergies or something else. I almost pointed out to the parents, they cry a lot. Oh, that's good. So it's probably not reflux, which sometimes throws them off because they have heard that that's reflux. But we have heard time after time that that's not the case. And in fact, I don't know if we'll probably get to treatment eventually, but all the studies that have used acid suppression to treat symptoms like crying or arching, or they've never found a benefit of acid suppression. Should we ask about some therapies then? Yeah, we yeah. can start with that. I think we've given a very mm-hmm. comprehensive review. I guess my brief mm-hmm. teach back would be that mainly it's like the timing that concerns mm-hmm. you from the case and not the arching or other things, right. which is good. Um, I think that's like something that a lot of people will take away that yeah. The crying and this, you know, the kind of those sometimes, at least in my experience, are the most concerning symptoms is that like the baby looks uncomfortable. And, and in fact, I think before uh, you, you mentioned something else about the food being digested or poorly digested. I really don't pay a lot of attention to that as well, because especially if the child has been already placed on acid suppression, you may not have a lot of that food looking digested in any way. So I usually don't pay a lot of attention to that. Well. Less for me to worry yeah. about. Yes. Now I have one question. Yeah. Um, in terms of like prevalence or age incidence, like I always feel that you know, when, with my kids, you know, mm-hmm. especially during burping, I always got some, a little bit of reflux. Mm-hmm. Things come up, but then as they got older, it definitely got less, and they were able to burp themselves and so forth. Would it be concerning if you all of a sudden see like a six-month-old like having much more reflux than they had been reported before? Yes. So that's, in fact, if you look at the guidelines of, uh, they were published three, four years ago, and I was a co-author of those guidelines on, on reflux, the indication for an upper GI series, which is an X-ray that looks at the anatomy of the GI tract, will be a reflux that doesn't resolve by 12 months of age, vomiting doesn't resolve by 12 months of age, or onset after several months of age. Because the classic trajectory of this condition of the benign gastroesophageal reflux is that it tends to get better by the time you begin to have more thickened food, like baby food, by the time you end up spending a little bit more time standing rather than laying down. 
by the time in which your amount of food that you take per unit of weight is less. Because if you think about it, a, a five, four, five ounces bottle that you take in 10 minutes, if you compare it to the weight of a baby, it's the same amount that would be like a gallon, like 3.2 <laughs> liters in a 70 kilo person. So if you take three liters, a gallon, in 10 minutes, as a grown-up, you will probably have some reflux, uh, I suspect. I love that analogy because I think sometimes it's really hard for parents to understand the, and I guess we'll get to this with therapy, but the frequency of burping and the mm -hmm. frequency of pausing. But I think it might be really helpful to say, how would you feel if you drank a gallon of milk in 10 minutes? Exactly. I love that. That's the, that's the perfect comparison. I use that all the time. So you did say something mm -hmm. about doing some sort of testing, but it sounds mm -hmm. like the first thing we do, especially if we're worried about disease, we try empiric treatment. Right. First, can you sort of explain sort of what are the first steps at looking at treatment yeah. and how you would explain that yeah. to a parent? So those are the big, the first intervention under the big umbrella of lifestyle changes, right? That in an older child and grown-ups would be smaller feeds and not going, not eating before going to bed and not smoking and so on. But in a baby, what that becomes is smaller feeds, smaller, more frequent feeds, exactly for the amount for the discussion that just because of the discussion we just had. Then try to thicken the feeds because thickening the feeds makes it a lot less likely to be regurgitated and there is plenty of, of data that suggests that thickening the feeds helps now the case you brought up was a breastfed baby which makes it a little bit more difficult or obviously more challenging but in a formula fed either going to the ar formula or adding thickeners to the formula is sometimes a game changer it makes it a little bit easier bring it down, swallowing down, especially if you may have a, a dysfunction swallowing mechanism, but also allows it to keep it down a lot more. So that those are very easy to implement type of changes that you should try to, to do before thinking, either testing or before thinking about treatments. Can you talk for just a, a brief moment mm -hmm. about the thickening yeah. of formula, specifically for parents that are not able to get the, the right. pre-thickened formula yeah. and the whether you're doing rice or oat right. as a recommendation, how yeah. much per ounce yes. or milliliter? So um, let's stay with the formula fed, then maybe we'll go back to the uh, uh, breastfed uh, afterwards. So the formula fed is interesting because all the initial studies done, done in the 90s by Susan Orenstein when she was in uh, Pittsburgh used one tablespoon of rice cereal per ounce of formula which is a lot, a which lot. makes it like cement. You <laughs> need to cross-cut the nipple to allow the child to take it, otherwise it's going to get fatigue and it's going to be impossible. So that becomes a little bit problematic because especially if you use rice cereal, you may get a little bit of constipation, which makes things a little bit more difficult. So I actually use one teaspoon of rice cereal per hour. Now, this is not an all or none phenomenon. The more you give, the thicker it gets, and it's going to actually give a lot of extra calories too, which is sometimes maybe a benefit for the child if they, you were a little concerned maybe about the weight. So you can do rice cereal. You can do oat cereal as well. Uh, I tend to use rice cereal because that's all the studies were done with rice. Uh, so there is literature behind it. I warn them maybe a little bit about the stools becoming a little harder. But otherwise, that's my ratio, uh, one teaspoon per ounce. So how long would this type of, you know, so we, we have a couple of different mm -hmm. interventions we look at, so thickening, and how long would you be willing to try this mm -hmm. sort of intervention before you decide that you need to do something else? So this is going to work immediately, Okay. right? At the first bottle you take, uh, you know, the mechanism is going to thicken the feeds, and so it's going to work fairly quickly. Interestingly, if you use the AR formula, and familiar AR, whatever AR formula you have, that formula will work well only if ingested in an acidic environment. So the pearl here is that if you use antacid therapy and the AR formula, you kind of defeat mm -hmm. the purpose because for the guam gar and all the thickeners to work, they need to find an acid environment because they are not thickened when you ingest them. They thicken in the stomach. So they work really well, but they need to have acid in the stomach. So you ah. kind of counteract the intervention if you put both acid suppression and, and the AR4. Don't do it at the same time. Got it. And for the for the breast milk, the only thing you can do is use something called gel mix, which is a thickener. So you will have to express it, of course, obviously, and then add something called gel mix because rice will not thicken well either amino acid-based formula or breast milk. So you have to use a commercially available thickener and the only one FDA-approved 
is something called Gelmix, G-L-M-I-X. I'm learning so much already. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> so I guess let's say that, you know, they go home and it didn't immediately work. <laughs> um, they're still having trouble after trying all sorts of different things and the baby's still spitting up with that longer duration that was concerning. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, uh, what do you try after that point? Like, what would you be your, your next steps in terms of trying to... That's a very good question because there's been a paradigm shift between the old guidelines and the new guidelines. Mm -hmm. The new guidelines, they actually say that before starting acid suppression, you should consider a, a trial of a, a extensively hydrolysate formula, mm -hmm. which are a little bit a step down from the soy formula and maybe not quite as elemental as the amino acid base formula. I don't know if we're allowed to use uh, names, but those would be the alimentum, nutrigen, progestinil. I'm just giving you a sense of the ones that are available there. Uh, I think that's helpful in, in practicality. Yeah. That's, yeah. you know, what we're counseling parents think, to look for. As long as we present all of them right, or right, majority right, of them, yeah, is fine. Yes, yeah. uh, and, and the reason why we decided to recommend that there was a lot of debate in the in the committee but the decision was made to go with that intervention before acid suppression for two reasons one is it's impossible based on symptoms to determine whether or not you're dealing with GERD or you're dealing with a, a dietary protein allergy mm -hmm. you cannot tell from the frequency of the vomiting the characteristics of the vomiting Yes, if you have bloody stools at the same time, that would go a little bit more along the allergy angle. But otherwise, that could be very well a presentation of dietary protein allergy. And then the second part is that uh, we have become a little bit more aware in the last probably 10 years or so of possible downside of prolonged acid suppression, which in the past we always thought was incredibly benign. So, you know, why not try but now that we have learned that maybe there are problems with prolonged acid suppression, we felt that the child maybe benefit more from a dietary change before you put them on medication. Is there any evidence behind using partially hydrolyzed formula in this context, or just that, that just not make sense because it wouldn't address right. a cow's milk there is, allergy? There, right. there is no data okay. that any of the designer formula, the low lactose, the one with pre prebiotics, the partially hydrolysate, the one with DHAs, which may be very good for other reasons, but there is no evidence that it will help somebody with a true dietary protein, cow's milk protein allergy. I don't want to get too much yeah. into the weeds on this because mm -hmm. we're talking about GERD, but can we talk quickly about yeah. some of the protein allergies and how that yeah. sort of relates and why it causes similar symptoms? It's if you have an inflamed upper GI tract, um, you know, if you have eosinophils infiltrating your stomach or your duodenum, you're going to probably develop a pylorospasm, the classic pylorospasm that radiologists often describe when you do an upper GI, and that will cause vomiting. So mm -hmm. inflammation in the upper GI tract will cause just as much vomiting as a bad reflux. Now, the problem is that it's going to take a good two, three weeks before your intervention will truly be beneficial because the child needs to heal their uh, inflamed upper GI tract. So this is not going to be an immediate benefit for the child, but it is the only thing you can do. Now, if the child is, if the mom is breastfeeding, then you need to put the mom mm -hmm. on a cow's milk free diet, on a dairy free diet. And would uh, that similarly be a trial of like three to four weeks? Yeah, maybe even longer because it's going to take maybe a little longer for the mom to become, for her breast milk to become devoid of bending antigen and then, then the child needs to heal. So it may take a little longer. Now at the end of the day, if the child is perfectly well, otherwise, and you're treating more parental anxiety, you may want to maybe try to minimize all these interventions. But if you begin to get a little worried child maybe is beginning to gross percentile a little bit, you know, occasionally you get maybe a little bit of diarrhea, the child is truly inconsolable crying, then I, I now, nowadays I usually change the formula before I do any type of uh, me medical uh, intervention. And to be clear, when we talk yeah. about protein allergy, we're talking like cow milk protein. Yeah. And as far as I, I, I've heard that Switching just the soy actually doesn't do this because soy that, well, it may, may still also have the milk yeah. protein as well. Is that yeah. correct? It, it, it not necessarily has the milk protein, but you, you are 30% chance to be allergic to soy as well if you're allergic to milk. So, yes, it will probably help half of your patients. But if you are at the point that uh, you're really worried about a child and if you have access to the extensively hydrolysate uh, formula, I will go to that as well because then you get 98, 99% of babies responding if that's the problem. 
very, very small minority will then need the amino acid. Perfect. Well, I'm pretty comfortable mm-hmm. with changing formulas normally, and Sydney mm-hmm. definitely is because she knows everything about them, it seems like. <laughs> but at what point do you think that um, pediatricians should start thinking about referring to a pediatric gastroenterologist um, throughout this whole process? Obviously, as we kind of talked mm-hmm. about, after you change the formula, if they don't get better, mm-hmm. Sometimes that next step would be like acid suppression, or I don't know if there are any procedures. So I guess when's when's a good time? Yeah, many factors play a role here. One is how easy or how accessible are your good friends, pediatric gastroenterologists, to your referral. And if it takes three months <laughs> to see them, then maybe it would be time to do a trial of acid suppression. If, on the other hand, you have fairly easy access to them, then I would probably this would be the time when I would refer it when. You have done the dietary change, you, you, the child is still struggling, the parents are still struggling, and you begin to get a little concern. The parents are not buying what you're selling. You're beginning to <laughs> worry a little bit yourself that I think I would prefer maybe at that point to, to see that patient before we even put them on acid suppression. On the other hand, if it truly takes another three months, then it's okay. You can start acid suppression if you're worried that there is truly good Let's say you begin to see a little bit of blood in the speed up, a little coffee ground every now and then. Uh, the child is maybe beginning to, once again, begin to have some food refusal, doesn't eat as well. Mm-hmm. Then then I think he, I would refer the patient, but in the meantime, it's probably okay to maybe start some acid suppression. You just mentioned blood in the spit up, mm-hmm. which just like sent tremors down my spine, but you don't seem actually that concerned about it. So if that's happening, that's not an emergent, I need to call the gastroenterologist and get them in tomorrow? Correct. Great. Uh, it's all, now, I don't want to sound also a little bit uh, too superficial here. But it all depends how much blood, right? I mean, if you have some coffee ground material in one of the vomiting and a child has been vomiting a lot, it's one thing. If you have brighter blood that is coming up <laughs> that looks like it's all blood, then you obviously you need to, to see the child right away and send him to the emergency, emergency room. But we would probably not scope that patient. We will probably just put him on acid suppression if it is just a you know, few streaks of some coffee ground material. This episode is brought to you by Uncommon Goods. Hey, if you haven't finished your holiday shopping yet, don't panic. We've got a secret source for incredible original gifts. That's Uncommon Goods. UncommonGoods.com has the absolute best gifts for everyone in your life. We're talking moms. We're talking dads. Teens, in-laws, besties, your secret crush in the radiology department, they have a gift for everyone. And it's not stuff you can find just anywhere. Uncommon Goods has unique and creative gifts. Skip the last-minute gifts and find something truly original at UncommonGoods.com. Some of my favorite things from the site, a portable campfire, a Bluetooth banana phone, a Mars Zen garden, and some hot cocoa bomb toolkits. Uncommon Goods looks for products that are high quality, unique, and made in the United States. They have the most meaningful out-of-ordinary gifts anywhere. From art to jewelry to kitchen, home, and bar, Uncommon Goods has something for everyone. And with every purchase you made at Uncommon Goods, they give back $1 to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than $2.5 million to date. So to get 15% off your next gift, go to UncommonGoods.com slash Cribsiders. That's UncommonGoods.com slash Cribsiders for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon Goods, they're out of the ordinary. So we've talked about acid suppression multiple times now. <laughs> Is a general pediatrician in my office and you know, I said, all right, I want to get you to get your neurologist. The parent calls me back and says, it is going to be yeah. two and a half, three months. Yeah. Can we do something in the meantime? What medicines should I be looking at starting and how do I dose it? So we don't have ranitidine anymore, right? That uh, mm-hmm. was pulled off the market. So you have famotidine among the H2 blockers. And then you have the proton pump inhibitors, which there are five um, uh, nowadays. So I would probably give famotidine now because it's liquid. It's a suspension, doesn't need to be compounded. While all the PPI, you need to open the capsule, so they need to be compounded, so it's not as user-friendly. Also, as I said, we would like probably to leave a little bit of acid secretion. There is nothing bad having a, a little bit of acid secretion in between the, the medications that you give. So I would use famodinin twice a day, 0.5 milligrams per kilo per dose, BID. That should give enough acid suppression that if the child has a little bit of esophagitis or some gastritis, he should be able to heal. If you want to go with uh, omeprazole or lansoprazole, they've all uh, been around for a long time. They're certainly 
very safe to use as well. At least in the short term, all these medications are safe and effective. Um, if you're treating the right thing, if you're treating acid, <laughs> right? That's so, my question. Yeah, that, that was yeah. going to be my next yeah. mix. So we were treating acid suppression right. and helping with the esophagitis and right. gastritis with healing, yeah. but we don't. We're not actually treating the the, the physiologic right. reflux. Correct. There is absolutely nothing that those medication will do to make your lower esophageal sphincter stronger or not open as much, and and there is really no way that they're going to be able to stop things from coming up. The only difference they're going to make is that there is less acid in your speed up, which mm -hmm. is already not commonly present in most speed up. So that's why it is really at the end of the of the algorithm down in box 15 or 16, and that and that's why it usually doesn't help very much in this case. Yes. So how do you approach the parent who's really worried about their child mm -hmm. who seems to be spitting spitting up all this all this time and. The, and you're saying, well, yeah, they're spitting up a lot. Let's put them on this medicine that will not change how they spit up. I, I, it's all about reasonable expectations, mm -hmm. right? That they, I'll tell them this medication helps irritation in your esophagus. Maybe it's been going on long enough. The child has been going on, you know, vomiting enough that there is a bit of, of irritation there. But chances are that it will not help the vomiting. In fact, the only thing that helps the vomiting are thickened feeds. And actually, a medication that we use for completely different things called baclofen. Baclofen hmm. actually helps decrease in reflux, but there's a lot of other downsides and, you know, that, that we will not use in an otherwise fairly well, healthy child. So I would try to draw the line in the sand and, uh, you know, and try to convince the family not to use acid suppression. Gotcha. Because unless you have truly coffee ground or some blood in the vomiting, because... As I said, studies after studies have shown that, that it doesn't help. Gotcha. So we do decide to do mm. acid suppression yeah. for these other more worrisome yeah. things. Right. And, of course, we set our expectations. Um, one, as it sounds like you're doing your H2 blockers mm. twice a day. Yeah. Are your PPIs you're also dosing twice a day? Or are you starting with once a day? And are we doing this? So, like, for my adult mm. patients, I tell them to take their PPI half an hour to an hour before their yes. first, first meal of the day. Are we giving any sort of those types of instructions for our kids? Obviously, babies are a little different because they're feeding all the time, probably feeding through the night sometimes, depending on which one we're starting. Is there any instructions that we'd give for that? So that's an excellent question. So, yes, ideally you want to give them 30 minutes to an hour before feeds, which is not always easy to remember, but at the end of the day, it will probably work still reasonably well even if you give it with the feeds. But, yes, the right way to give it is 30 minutes before the feeds because you want to have your proton pump being activated by the food, by the, you know, the time the, the, the medication needs to be absorbed and be ready to kick in. So 30 minutes is perfect. And yes, I would go once a day. There was for a while this uh, thought, this, this myth that it needs to be given twice a day. But they've all been approved by the FDA as a once a day. vast majority of adults that use them use them either as needed or once a day. There is really almost no indication for twice a day PPI in pediatric. Maybe only if you're treating H. pylori or using ophilic esophagitis or something completely different. But once a day is the way to give it. And the other very important thing is you need to win them. If you've been on for more than three months, don't stop cold turkey because you're going to have a rebound hypersecretion mm -hmm. that is going to make you feel bad. Because when you take producing acid suppression, there is a hypergastrinemia. Your gastrin goes up in your blood because that's a feedback mechanism that is physiologic. And then when you stop the acid suppression, you stop the medication, suddenly you have a, a, a massive acid secretion and you feel like you feel terrible. It's a medication that almost creates a need for itself. So win them if you've been on for more than three, four months. To that point, can you talk a little bit more about duration yeah. of therapy, given that we know that a lot of these kids, as their esophagus gets longer, yeah. are going to stop having as much yeah. reflux? And then also, you've alluded a couple times to some of these more recently discovered risks of mm -hmm. long-term use yeah. and what those risks are, how long we, sh if we have, you know, what is the duration at which you become afraid of that? So both for uh, acid suppression, but also for dietary protein allergy or, you know, to, to the other question is how long you're going to stay with an extensively hydrolysate formula. I tell them at 12 months of age to try to experiment. Only one of the two things if you're on both, but I try to wean them off the medications by 12 months of age. By that time, most babies stop spitting up, they stop crying as much, 
colleagues, infantile colleagues, it's gone by that time. So 12 months of age is a reasonable time to try to stop the medications and try to liberalize the diet as well if you were on a dairy-free diet. Now, if they go back on medication, whatever you did, whatever you treated is coming back, the patient needs to be evaluated. Why? Do they have eosinophilic esophagitis? Do they have something else? Do they have a web? Do they have a more severe an allergy to other things as well? So once you have failed a trial of discontinuing acid suppression, in my mind, the child needs to be seen by a specialist and probably needs some testing. And that's personal opinion. <laughs> So I guess that's the next question, right? So you as, as a specialist now, because it's a little outside, mm-hmm. now, now we've progressed past like what we've done. And now I'm, I, my, my patient's mm-hmm. seeing you. What am I seeing in your consult report coming back to me? What are the things that you're, you're choosing and what mm-hmm. tests, why are you choosing those tests? Yeah, so if I'm worried about the child, I want to make sure that it doesn't have a malrotation or a antral web, any anatomical issue. So I'm going to probably do an upper GI series at that point. And depending from other things as well, you know, family history or personal history of the child that's a lot of eczema and other allergic problems. Now we will probably consider doing an endoscopy to screen for eosinophilic esophagitis, which is a condition that is increasingly dramatically in prevalence. And the only way to diagnose that, unfortunately, is by doing an endoscopy. And once again, at that that age, symptoms can be really overlap between bad reflux and the EOE. And so you do the scope, mm-hmm. and it's by biopsy mm-hmm. too, because I've I've definitely had the oh I see the scope report the endoscopist is like looks like it could be E, and then mm-hmm. the biopsy comes back yeah. negative. So yeah. definitely, usually we're waiting back for that biopsy. Correct. Correct. We always differently at times from our adult colleagues. We all, always biopsy both you know the duodenum, the stomach, and the esophagus. And uh, to be honest, most experience. Endoscopies can tell visually if the, the child has eosinophilic esophagitis, but the biopsy are the uh, the clincher. You need to have eosinophils in the biopsy. Uh-huh. So I think we addressed most of the workup, mm-hmm. which was the upper GI series, mm-hmm. the endoscopy. The other thing that you mentioned is like pH testing and all those mm-hmm. sorts of things. Yeah. Are those ever used for in the specialist office for yeah. reflux workup? Very, very good point. Yes, pH impedance testing. I, I think that nowadays is almost obsolete to think about just pH by itself. It needs to be pH impedance because impedance tell us also about non-acid reflux, which is really the most common type of reflux that babies have. So you need to do pH impedance. And we tend to do it when uh, symptoms are confusing. Let's say the child with chronic cough or with you know recurrent bradycardia or apneic episodes. So you know, the ENT send you the patient saying that have horrible uh, vocal cords, and that's also often an overcall by our ENT colleagues. But when you want to put together symptoms and episodes of reflux, then that's the time when we do pH impedance. Or when the question comes up, maybe is it time to do a phone duplication? Now, that's the, tend to be more reserved to children with uh, uh, neurological handicaps and multiple comorbidities, but still a, a, a group of patients will nowadays will still get a, a anti-reflux surgery and those patients really want to make sure that you're not treating something else with surgery. So I, I want to get to yeah. fund application in yeah. a minute but first I, mm-hmm. I, as most of us work in institutions where we have EMRs and probably have access yes. to all sorts of reviewing reports for tests and so say if I was an enterprising resident mm-hmm. and my patient was sent to uh, to the GI doctor and had this uh, pH impedance probe done. What, what and I and I and I actually can read the report myself. What, what are they? What am I seeing? Like, and how do I interpret that? Like, because I've definitely seen them, and you know, you're seeing like the pH, you know, and their cutoffs, and like, it always looks like squiggles to me. Just sort yeah. of like when I look at like EEGs and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. So, yes, actually, it's uh, in some ways even more challenging to interpret because there are a lot of artifacts, and uh, so you really want to have somebody who's experienced. Uh, in reading uh, pH impedance. Even in our very large group, and there are 30 pediatric gastroenterologists in our practice, there is only one that reads oh, the wow. pH impedance uh, results. So, uh, And then what we do, we really look at something called symptom correlation. There are some indices that now you can develop. Uh, they are computerized way to analyze the, the study together with a visual interpretation. You try to correlate symptoms with intraesophageal events. That means 
reflux, but sometimes even air swallowing. Sometimes you can get symptoms because you swallow a lot of air, and you can tell with impedance the difference between air swallowing or things coming up. Oh, interesting. Um, so, yes, you can actually have it esophagus that become distended from a lot of air swallowing, and there are a lot of babies that actually do that, and you don't know unless you do the impedance study. Gotcha. So the short answer is don't, don't do read it. it. <laughs> yeah. Don't be enterprising. <laughs> don't be enterprising. <laughs> Maybe if the resident's looking at going to Pete's GI, they should at least you know, look at it. <laughs> Before we move on, I don't want to spend too much time on pH impedance, but I feel like when we talk about those other studies, I know kind of what to expect and what to counsel families on mm -hmm. what is going to happen. What actually happens in a pH impedance study? So you, you get a probe, a little tiny probe, but, you know, as small as a small spaghetti, but it's still a probe from your nose into your lower part of the esophagus all the way into the stomach. And there are different sensors at different uh, uh, levels throughout the entire esophagus that measured impedance that tells you that whether or not you have liquid come, coming up, how high it gets, and or you have air, or you have air uh, either swallowed or coming up. So you basically monitor intraesophageal events for 24 hours. Because the esophagus is a very simple organ. All it wants to do is to stay empty. That's the only job of an esophagus. Either it has to push things down or get rid of things when they come up. And whenever there is something staying there, it's not normal, and that's what the impedance does. But it's a 24-hour test and involves a tube, uh, a probe through the nose into the upper GI tract. And is this is this placed in the endoscopy suite or in, in a procedure suite in your office? Or? It's placed like an NG tube. It's placed by the nurses or the physician, and they're usually in the office, uh, in clinic or in the motility suite. Or okay. So it's a fairly... Not super. Not, not fun. <laughs> I can see for for, for a little baby. Yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit about the surgical uh, indications mm -hmm. and the actual surgery. So you sort of start off with you know at a certain point if it's if it's really bad mm -hmm. and um, there may be other other factors involved mm -hmm. with with the child that um, you, you talked about fun vocation. I think mm -hmm. when I was a resident and or actually when I was a med student and I was on my ped surgery rotation, we I saw a lot of Nissen fun applications yeah. and. Uh, if I remember correctly, they take part of the the fundus and they wrap it around the top to make a basically a, a new a new sphincter, correct? Because an external the, cuff, ex basically okay. an external cuff, a cuff around the esophagus. Because the lower esophageal sphincter, from what I hear, is not a true sphincter, correct? It's sort of like a physiologic pressure difference between thorax and the abdomen, correct? Yeah, I mean it is a sphincter. That's what what it is in terms of. Uh, uh, having a higher pressure than uh, both the esophagus and the stomach and opens up when things go forward and it's supposed to increase in pressure when things go backward. And in some people, it doesn't work, either because you have a hiatal hernia or because it just is diff you know doesn't work as well. Uh, a lot of us grown-ups, uh, the sphincter gets a little weaker and we get a little bit more reflux. So it's interesting, the fundal application, the surgery for reflux has really gone from, uh, there's been a, a, like a pendulum swing. It was done a lot in the 90s and uh, maybe 80s and so on. And then it became almost like a bad word. You never do it. You will do a GJ tube first. So mm -hmm. it, now I think the pendulum is swinging somewhere in the middle. It's still a very effective, a very effective surgery in the right patients with the right indication. But between maybe GJ uh, feeds and maybe the fact that we're now able to thicken the feeds, let's say kids who get G tube, that have cerebral palsy, now with a blenderized diet and uh, more thickened foods, we can avoid a lot of reflux. Actually, we're doing it probably less than we were doing in the 90s. But on the other hand, I still think that uh, has a role. And if you if you have a child that aspirates, for example, when he refluxes, fundoplication will protect you from that. So, so can we go through that list one yeah. more time? So a uh, child with high risk for aspiration... Yeah. Uh, who else? Who else would you? Would Child that doesn't keep down anything, right? That you put things in the in the stomach, and everything comes up. Now you can do a GJ, or a surgical J, but that's not a very child friendly intervention. Mm -hmm. a GJ tubes often cause into susception on the tip, often they become dislodged, and not everybody has access to a hospital within a few minutes. And I think a GJ, I think of it as a, a short term, proof of concept type of things. You get really well with that. You know that the problem is that the stomach is not working well, and you can decide whether you, know, whether you want to keep a GJ forever or for a long period of time, or maybe do a funder that will make you less likely uh, to have uh, reflux events. Now, the older you are, the better it is, because if you do a fund application when you're six months old, by the time you grow 
from the application sometimes may become a little bit undone. If you do it in a six-year-old, it's much more likely to be an effective intervention for life. Okay, yeah, that was my next question. Mm-hmm. Was like, so obviously it's, it's a surgery that's fairly permanent. It's permanent. Um, for some of our older mm-hmm. kids, and you know, I, I even take care of adults who've had fund application. Mm-hmm. Like, what are the types of long-term adverse effects you can we see from our patients who've had it? Other than obviously the the, uh, the mm-hmm. fund application becoming undone. Yeah. Um, are there other risks that we have to worry about and and pay attention to? So in the short term, dysphagia, because you create now a tight valve, often edematous and things don't go down very easily. In a little bit longer term is your inability to vomit or belch as easily. Um, you know, a perfect fund application will still allow that, you know, when it's really a forceful time to vomit, uh, you, you should still be able to vomit. But let's say that you have a child that needs to be vented all the time and now cannot vomit anymore. The child may actually even need a G-tube together with a fund application just to make sure that they don't get too much of an urge to retch and vomit, and that will cause the funder to fall apart. So overall, pretty well tolerated, and uh, they are very effective. But obviously, I think you mentioned as a permanent surgery. Yes, it is a permanent surgery. You're never going to be able to undo it and put back exactly the child as it was. Uh, so revising fund application is a big deal. One thing you mentioned as well, um, hiatal hernia, sliding hernia. Mm-hmm. How, how does that play in this this whole thing? And it sounds like, you know, especially with the reflexes really related to these types of hernias, they, they may be useful. Mm. Does it play any other types of roles or does it change your management in other ways? Yeah, large hiatal hernia makes reflux a lot more difficult to control. Now you have part of your stomach and your chest. Acid tend to accumulate in that area of lower pressure, negative intrathoracic pressure. You create what people have called an acid pocket. And then every time you open your esophagus, your lower esophageal sphincter, either because you swallow or you try to belch, you have a lot of acid there ready to, to come up. So hiatal hernia, especially if it becomes a good size hernia, it is an indication to consider maybe a surgical intervention. The other patient population that uh, is a high risk for reflux, and nowadays we see a lot of that, is the obesity patients that are heavily overweight and have a lot of obesity. Those are both a high risk for hiatal hernia also high risk for reflux. Are there congenital hiatal hernias? Are there babies that are born with that? Very, very unusual to have a congenital hiatal hernia that is not part of a more complex diaphragmatic hernia where you have more than just the stomach in your, in your chest. Do we have any more questions, Nick? I think that's plenty. All right. <laughs> we should probably bring it home. Can you summarize some of your favorite take-home points for our listeners, things that if they take nothing else from, from this episode, what do they need to remember? Probably the biggest one is that irritability, crying, arching are rarely symptoms of reflux in the baby. The other one is uh, acid suppression is still your friend. It still works really well, but for the right indication. And just don't forget that you play somebody on acid suppression and just leave it home forever and then try to wean people from acid suppression. Excellent, excellent. And before you leave us, do you have anything you want to plug? Is there, you know, uh, is there like a, you know, a GI institution or a GERD society that we all need to be aware of and, uh, or anything else? NASPRIN, our pediatric GI society, is a, a terrific uh, society that probably also the only one that takes people from residency throughout fellowship to junior faculty with the yearly conferences that are targeted to them, yearly get-together, he really does a great job to get uh, junior people uh, to become a family, uh, probably more than any other society that I know. So if you're still thinking about maybe uh, the <laughs> fellowship, GI is a good one. Excellent. Well, thank you again for talking to us in person here at AAP National Convention. Carlo, I just wanted to ask yeah. one more thing. Yeah. Are you willing to share your Twitter handle with our listeners? Carlo Di Lorenzo 1. Oh, oh one wow. Word. Okay. First one, All right. Number one. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much to, I'm going to take us out. So this has been another episode, another episode of the Crib Ciders. It's for the kids. Get show notes and sign up for our weekly knowledge food formula feeds newsletter on our website at www.thecribsiders.com. We're committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do so, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or contact us at thecribsiders at gmail.com. 
special thanks to Sydney Engel for joining us on our in-person talk here and for Joan Park, our AAP czar, our showrunner, Sam Mazur, and our wonderful social media team on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I've been Nick Lee. I've been Sydney Engel. And this has been Chris the Chew and Chew. Thank you. Good night. Or afternoon. Morning? <laughs> what time? <laughs> Sometime. Too late. Bye. <laughs> Hey, you've already listened to the entire episode. Now claim CME credit. Continuing education credit is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. VCU is accredited to provide continuing education to the entire healthcare team. Check it out at cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information and to claim your credit after listening to this episode.